so on. So this is this holds true actually. So this is they are like a gazillion of these, and this one is one of the more famous ones. And in essence, it says that you cannot really estimate estimate anything really really precisely. And this is true, but this is in a general sense. So luckily, we don't work in this particular very generic sense. We estimate domain in particular domains. So we, we are in better shape in this, but this actually holds true. Uh, let, let me find the best position to talk and move through slides. Okay, so the point is, it's difficult. It really is difficult. It, I mean, estimating, I mean, you can, estimating is easy, but getting it right is really, really, really difficult. And um, estimations are a crucial part of any project or of pretty much of any effort because, you know, they define a lot of things, you know, uh, whether you will have enough money or, or resources to do stuff or not. So wrong estimation can, can kill a project and historically it did. So, so it's very important to do it right, but it's very, very difficult. And why it's so difficult? Mostly because of this. And this is the cone of uncertainty. You've probably seen this one. Uh, there are also a gazillion images of this on the internet, and there are some more, more, you know, with more colors and more beautiful than this one. But this one is very simple, and that's what I like. It basically it says this: the point in time, and there is a axis down, which is time, which is implied. The point in time when you will know all about the project, and the point in time where you will be able to actually estimate it is the second that you deliver it and the sentence is done. That's, that's, that's actually what it says. It, it says that right here, on the, on the, in the really initial phases of the project, you, you are about, you err about four times. Your error margin, margin will be, you will either be four times off up one way or the other. So this, and this usually, you, you cannot really tell your, your stakeholders yeah, this is this will be in a hundred hours, give or take three hundred. This doesn't work. But the point is, this actually is you are asked to do that because your first estimates are, are always good. In my experience, one disclaimer: everything that I will talk about is just from experience. I might be wrong, but stuff is just stuff that happened to me while doing this. So pretty much always is there. And there is also one thing which is really, really, really risky or tricky because there is no such as unbinding no matter how much they swear on their mother that it's just for information purposes and they'll never lose it. Once you tell the number, that number stays. And then you can really, really to argue to change it. This is, and this is tricky because once again, you're there. You're not, you're not in, in, in the place where you can actually get a good number. So this is why it's really hard. Uh, and luckily you can, I mean, how do you, how do you fix this? As you see, all these uh, arrows, the names are not really important, but the point is that in every, uh, every particular arrow, a little bit more about the system is discovered or specified, or some assumptions are, are, are set, and this narrows it down. Because there, at the beginning, just I need, a, I need a project that does something, X, and tell me how much it will cost. Okay, so, uh, and of course, it's, it's it's not, it's not all. We, we have, there's another aspect why it's difficult. It's because our brains are not designed to do this. We are really not designed to estimate the absolute values. And we are really, really prone to, um, to a lot of cognitive fallacies. If you go on Wikipedia and uh, write down cognitive fallacies, the list is like five pages long. And, it, and, it's, and it's just first group. So our, our minds are really, really not that, that good at stuff that we take for granted. For example, visual thinking. The, the thing is that uh, we are we tend to uh, give more weight to the to the notion that make us feel good. So regardless of whether it's true or not, but if there are two competing you know facts or, or notions in your in your mind, and when you are estimating, you have to take a huge number of facts and notions and really fit this all together. Those no, notions that make you feel good, that that, that gives you, you this warm fuzzy feeling, you wait them more and value them more and it will, they will influence your estimates more. This is uh, this also can you know turn into oh my god we're all gonna die situation where you have a really bad experience and then all of your then you only emphasize bad stuff. 
but otherwise it, it messes up your motor estimation skill. Planning fallacy is pretty much the same. It, it's really, it, it goes from that, is that uh, when you're estimating, you typically are more prone to estimate or to, or to be optimistic when estimating if you are the one who will be doing the job and, uh, uh, and be pessimistic when somebody else is. And this is a number of experiments that show that this works. The, yeah, the, the experiments that the college students right? like they always do, and this actually holds true. Also, it's sometimes it's reverse, but it's always bias. And anchoring, anchoring is that what I just said on the slide before. When you tell a number, first information that comes in our you know, field of understanding about some some problem will hold most weight. Uh, this is like uh, you no, know, this is just unbinding, but I think it's about 100 hours, that's it. Everything else will be weighted in this, in this way. This is the way the, the, the headroom goes, and so if you, you bid a car, you say this car costs like 15,000 euros, even if it's only 10, then when you get it for 13, you'll be very happy because psychologically you will feel that it's less than what is initially uh, uh, estimated, and therefore you won. But this is, this is something, this also goes that if you saw some great tool that does something, your estimate will be hugely influenced by the fact that you think it's now only powerful and it will solve all your problems. This is anchoring. And there are a number more. So so this is yeah, so this is this is what goes against us really. And it's so it's not that okay, so all this is not lost because there as, as I said in the beginning, there are two things that really goes for us. One is that we are actually uh, when I said we are, I think more in, in since PMs usually don't estimate. In my in my experience, uh, it's usually developers or business analysts. Uh, they are usually experts in what they do, so they are not estimating. For example, I'm a developer, so I can probably pretty much I can be fairly accurate if you ask me to you know, build a simple application. I'll be fairly accurate if I did something before, like that before. But if you ask me to build a chair. I will be out of my league. I, I wouldn't be able to really be precise. I would okay. I will, I'll try to apply what I know from engineering, but this will be way, way, way worse than if you ask me to build something, you know, development wise. So this goes for us. This gets us a bit more on the right side of points of uncertainty. And since I mean, when I say we, I mean pretty much us. We are. I'm. I'm, I'm a developer in, in a web development company. So. There are similarities. We don't do everything completely new. We, we use some frameworks. We, we use some, you know, some patterns. Some, some parts of the system are more or less the same. So when we estimate, we don't go for really something completely. Like if I would estimate, you know, how much it would take me to learn, and you know, cardio surgery, I wouldn't be able to like, have any reference points. Not so. This is stuff which we are familiar with, and this. Yeah, this, this, this is important because a lot of the other stuff that we've talked about is coming from this. Okay, so, and so, the, I'll share a few techniques that we, that we found that makes this easier and gives a better result than just, you know, doing the bundle. So, this is the first one. <coughs> I mean, this one is obvious. You need to break it down because if I am about to estimate an application, it takes me, like, Two, two, it, it, so like two months worth of work, and I need to estimate it in hours. I will definitely miss because it's just too much stuff to take into into, into your head, at least for me, and really model it in your brain without you know and, and throwing all the biases and you know sorting all this stuff out. So uh, this is this is a, like a no brainer. So you should do it. But there is trick out. There is yeah. There are many ways to do it. What we found works best is if you make each unit a you know, value-adding unit. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that's deliverable. It doesn't mean that it has to be done, but uh, that has to go to production. It definitely doesn't, but it's something that, that's demoable to somebody who is not really part of this team. So uh, in this case, you get uh, better discussions when estimating. I will get to, to it in, in, in later points, because it's something that not just technical per, per person can understand, and you will get a lot, a lot, a lot of, of, from people who are not technical. You will get a lot, of, a lot of good stuff about estimates. So maybe each one is really understandable. So well, how we do it? We usually, you know, write little stories and then acceptance test with, with, with uh, 
examples, and this usually is enough, and while it will give a fairly good estimate. So, the next one is, and this one is probably the most important one, always with range. There is no single digit answer, single number answer to a, to a question how long or how much resources will this take. There's only, and also this is like, I will maybe jump a bit ahead, but there is also, the answer is always it will take me from at least this much and as, as, at worst that much. So this is very important. You can only estimate for yourself. You can, I, I have no idea how much Steve, it will take Steve to develop this, but it's the same thing that I will do. I, I cannot be sure. Uh, and also, I, there is no single answer. And range is extremely important because it gives you, it also communicates one thing, if this is a risk. Because if you have, if estimates that you, you know, come together with a team and see that it's five to ten hours, yeah, that's fairly certain. But it's five to fifty-five hours, then it's not. And this community, and if the uh, estimate was just one number, you lose this information. This is hugely important, important information. So always, always use ranges, and and then you can use this. You can use three-point estimate. Three-point estimate is just the way to use ranges in your estimates, nothing more. It's it's, it's some mathematics. It's a very simple one. It, it's not a silver bullet. You will see the next slide. Give some promises which are not really true, but what is this is very important. This is the process. First, you start your, with your unit of work, unit, unit, your item that you're estimating, and identify positive, and negative risks. Positive risks are just stuff that, if they happen, then then we'll we we'll, we we'll be you know this will help and reduce the amount of effort, amount of time, amount of whatever. Then and negatives are obviously you know uh, <coughs> what are the negative risks? We discuss them. That's very important. Uh, the estimation process is really a communication. It's not, I want you an estimate and then you give me an estimate. It doesn't work like that. This, this should, I mean, it can, but it's, then the results are not very good. It should be a discussion. So there should be, everybody should understand why this is, why a um, particular estimate is given. So you identify those risks and discuss them and write them down. We write them down on, on this particular card. So that, and then first you get most likely, because if you get first pessimistic and optimistic, then everybody just kind of naturally goes in the middle and says more, like, more, more likely is in the middle, most likely is in the middle, so get most likely estimate, and then first pessimistic and optimistic. In scenarios where there are number of people, and I'm in, implying this in, uh, while I'm talking, uh, you play the version of, of planning poker. You really start the most likely, kind of narrow it down until there is no really bad outliers and then go with the, with the range and do the same. So it won't be as precise as finding poker in sense that you get the number, but finding poker is not precise because you get the number which is not an effort estimate, so, so it doesn't matter anyway. So, so this is, you get those estimates, and then you do the magic with mathematics. So you count that this is really a weighted average. What, it, what this part here says is that this particular method uh, uh, values um, the, the most likely estimate four times as much as values optimistic and pessimistic. And then you, this is your like, uh, estimate. PERT, PERT is, is um, abbreviation for something that I knew and I forgot, so I have no idea. But it's, I think it's an organization. And this is just one of the methods. There, there, there are a couple of these weighted averages stuff. They all vary a little bit and they all, they're, they're kind of empirical. So you, you should try a few to see what gives better results for your particular setting, for your particular project task and so on. And then you calculate standard deviation and then you sum it up for the project. For the task, the point is um, that this task should be uh, ideally. So this is one thing that you to take bear in mind when you are dividing stuff in, 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 in items or in tasks. They should be, um, uh, they shouldn't depend on each other, ideally. It won't be, you won't be able to do it all, all the time, but they should. And the standard deviation, and you, this, is, this is just mathematical. I, I didn't have a better way to write it down, really. And this is just a standard mathematical way to do it. There are also variations on this, and it's empirical stuff. You try, uh, it gives slightly different results, just you know, depending on your domain. And then, the great promise, which is this. Uh, why would you need it as a project uh, manager? Because it says that if you need 95% confidence about in your estimate, you take an estimate of the project that you calculated, and it's in the range of plus and plus and minus two uh, standard deviations, which is, yeah, obviously a typo, it should be FD here. 
So obviously this is false precision. I mean, yeah, nobody guarantees you 99.7 precision if, if you, you know, take three some deviations up and down. It's, but it's a rule of thumb. It, it, and it, it's fairly okay if you, you know, but the trick is not to miss on any, on any important tasks and so on. But for the stuff that you know about, this is pretty accurate. So this is pre-point estimating. It's, you know, it's not as scary. It's mathematically pretty simple once you, you know, there are like a couple of formulas and that's it. So, this is for that. And, okay, this comes, as I said, I, I alluded to this. Always estimate the team. The point is, as I said, there is no such thing as estimate for somebody else. I can only estimate, and I mean, I can, I can estimate for, for, for anybody, but only fairly precise estimates can be about uh, if I'm estimating for myself. As I said, I have no idea how much the same task with the uh, and speed. However, that, this is because we each have a different context in our heads about what needs to be done. And this is very valid because uh, my context is probably not completely accurate. I have some, you know, assumptions that are wrong. I have, I don't maybe know some stuff. Steve maybe doesn't know the same stuff, but he knows something I don't know, and he has a different context. And therefore, when we, what, what we are communicating we are with our estimates, and especially with their ranges, is our our vision, our, our understanding of it's our absolute understanding of, understanding of the problem. So you need to estimate with the team. Uh, and cross-functional teams will also work if you have units of work which are understandable, which are not incredibly technical. Sometimes you cannot avoid it because there are, you know, you are doing some refactoring work or, or infrastructure work, but there always should be a clear understanding of why it's done and, and it should be written in, in a, a language that is understandable to, to, to anyone, and especially to the project manager to get that later. So, so this is this is just you know it's simple. You play you do plan and poker with ranges. That's what I uh, when I said by variation basically what I described before. You discuss discrepancies, and that's very very important. You work, uh, whenever you have discrepancy, for example, if the estimate for you know, mo most likely for me is ten and for Steve is twenty, and then your PM should ask, okay, Berkeley why ten, Steve why twenty, and there should be discussion. And we should have good reasons, we should be able to defend our estimates. And uh, reasons for why he taught 20, I taught 10 should be written down. This is extremely important because these things are invaluable later when somebody is working on it and even for defining the scope. Uh, also, when you see stuff with wide margins, and this is why it's great to have you know, ranges, then you should mark it. If something is 5 to 55 hours, then this just says we have no idea. We hope it won't be more than 55, but in, in, in honesty, we have no idea. And you need to you know, mark those and investigate them. You, pretty much that's when business analysts come into play and, and talk to the main experts and, and, and so on and so on. But a lot of hidden assumptions get out of this way because when you estimate, it, it turns out that nobody can really reconcile all the different estimates and the range is just big. And then uh, whatever you do, you have to have an assumptions list and update it at all times. Whatever you Whatever is said, whatever is discovered, it goes to the assumption test. This goes to the next, uh, this is right on all the assumptions. The assumptions are, uh, are, I mean, the specification is an ultimate assumption, really. it just defines everything, but the point is, without assumptions, your scope is, you know, entire universe. And there is always some task, but this is some, some, some project goal or something, but it's all, always very, quite vague, however well defined. So, in the, uh, what I'm trying to say is that, that there is no estimate without context. It doesn't make sense. If I, say, if I tell you that it will take me an hour and a half to get from here to Rijeka, you'll probably figure out I'll go with a car, I might go with, with, with a bus, a number of different places. So, and if there is some, for instance, if you, we talked about cycling and, and you, you figure out that I will go with a bike, then, this, then my estimate is completely wrong. So the point is, an estimate without context is completely useless. And what, it, what assumptions give you, do they, I mean, give to every reader, they give context. And the, the trick about writing them, because you usually start before there is a really formal documentation, and you just you know, write them down. The trick is, you need to have this like contract mindset when you write them, because you must assume they will, uh, if, if we are interpreting, developers and those who estimate will interpret interpret them in their least form, and the client will interpret them in their most wide form. 
So you have to really guard yourself again and, and use really precise wording, really defined, uh, we, uh, I typically write glossaries and stuff like that. So we really understand the terms and define everything. And when we define boundaries and so on, this helps immensely in at least communicating what's, uh, or discovering that we have different assumptions because there are the most, the most common reason why why estimates fail are hidden, uh, are unspoken assumptions. And this gets rid of that if they are communicated right from the bed and, and in a clear and concise way. So that we cannot, you should be able to interpret them really. Okay, so this one is a no-brainer. If you have and uh, you know past experience with similar items, use it, it will help immensely. I mean this helps. Um, the thing is, when I, I'm not, not talking from the point of the developer. If you ask me to do some particular task, I can do that in, in, in 20 different ways. And what's usual process is the sales asks you, okay, how much it will take? And you say X, and they say, no, that's too much. And then you try Y, and it's a bit lower, but you just, you don't have confidence. You, you threw something out, but you don't really have good reasons except to make it cheaper. And then they say, no, that's still too much. What it's what what this really gets prevented if you say okay, can we do this in this budget? And then you design into the budget. And every good engineer can do this. This really really works. Every good engineer can do this and, and get really really good results. So uh, it, sometimes it's just not possible. I have had experiences with sales which we just that just didn't get. They say no, make it more, make it cheaper, or make it more, make it last short amount of time or something. But this, this is the point. Okay. Okay, so this is this is really yeah, for the project managers. So um, I mean I'm a technical guy so it's more difficult to you know sell so the bullshit technical wise than, than somebody who is not. But the point is the reasons why I estimate is X and not Y should be obvious, should be really, really clearly explainable by the team members. So unless it is, it's perfectly fine to push for an explanation. And maybe not every single bit of the information will be you know, completely understandable to you, and this is fine, but you should be able to understand why something that takes that much. Because uh, one good thing is, uh, if somebody is you know, telling you it just, it just needs to be that this is a complex system, just ask the question, what if we don't do that? What would happen instead? And this usually starts a conversation because then by revealing the effects, they kind of give you the idea of okay, why are we actually doing this? So this is one thing you really need to discuss with the numbers and understand that and it's perfectly possible and nobody who tells you it's not it's, it's bullshit to you. So staff also to take uh, to to uh, take notice if somebody gives you really really precise estimates, they're probably fooling themselves to you and other otherwise they have really good explanation. And you should be able to understand this explanation. That, that's, that's the key point here. Okay, this is, um, yeah, this is. You will fail, obviously. You will not. There is no such thing as precise and, and correct estimate. There are better and worse ones, but you will definitely fail. And, and the trick is when you when you give range, somebody needs because clients don't pay in ranges. They want a particular number, and sales kind of like lower and so yeah so it will get it will get transferred to a number at one point in time and this number will be correct this is just the given thing this can be helped so one way to guard against this is uh, to design uh, each item scope of each item to give you leeway and what's the format that I have spoke about uh, user stories with acceptance criteria and estimates are really really good about this because it really tells you what to what needs to be done and not how. And as I said, there are like 10 different things that you can pretty much do any, any program does, any good engineer can. So if you have your specification in a way that you can choose the scope while still you know, being clear that this doesn't mean that you should you know, produce garbage. There is very clear you know, definition of what, what this thing needs to accomplish. And as long as it's accomplished, it doesn't matter if it's implementation A, B or C. Okay, unless you're doing top, top terrible program and stuff like that. But the point is, uh, this gives you a tool that when sometimes in the project you, you know, 
check on the, on the states and see maybe everything is not right, you have to, to rectify this because you can change the scope accordingly. You can, this is not something that gives you a great freedom that you know you can you can you know, miss whatever you like. But if you are if your other numbers are fairly okay and you have like a fairly standard a margin of error, then this will give you some additional additional help. This this saved my ass a couple of times. So this is this is a good thing. So so in actual this is it. This, these are the techniques that kind of work that work for, for, for us, for me. And the point is you can use any of them and just don't do this. Just don't do this. And yeah, and that's it. Thank you for your time. And yeah, I'll put your questions and everything I'm asked. Do you have any numbers you can share with us? Good point. Not on anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about whether I can. There, there's, I will give you some examples when, when, when I was wrong. So maybe this will help. The most, the most uh, wrong estimates um, uh, that I've done were done when uh, I've neglected, or basically the entire team pretty much neglected, uh, the impact that third party might have. So, a situation where we, you know, we had, we had our stuff fairly, okay, fairly, not, uh, fairly accurately uh, uh, um, estimated, but there was a third party which, we, which, which was a dependency and nobody thought it would be so bad. And it was total disaster. We blew our budget like, you know, one stop or something like that. So this is the case, uh, th these are the most time the case, most of the time the case. And, uh, uh, underestimated the other case is underestimating uh, the overhead that in, in introducing new processes and new techniques really adds to the project. You get this is the this is the standard uh, you know um, uh, information BS. It feels good. I want to introduce this this uh, technologies. I want to do this project. They, they work. They obviously work. They work for everybody. They work for me. And then I don't listen to the the, you know, voice in the head to say, okay, but we never did this. this. Maybe somebody will find it difficult. Maybe, you know, something. This and the third is, I mean, this one is pretty much this kind of resource management, but what we discovered, it's, yeah, it's, now it's obvious, and yeah, we'll see, duh. But um, when you have estimate, let's say, like 100 hours for a particular person, this should be 100 hours in a succession. Maybe a little breaks in it, but not. Two days in this week, three days in this week, then two days in this week, this doesn't work. The context switching, the getting back to the project, just, just messes everything up. So this is, I, I don't have the better numbers, but these are the typical scenarios where, where we fail and we fail bad. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just have a related question. So you said uh, one of the examples was third party involved. Yes. Yeah. What was this third party? Was it like another supplier? Somebody had to work it was, with on the client side? It Who was, was it? a kind of operations provider. So, uh, I mean, we are a web, uh, web development company. We don't do operations and posting. So it was another another party. Mm -hmm. And they, it was a combination of their internal ineptitude. Stop it, I can totally tell you. It's, it's, it's yeah, terrible. But, uh, uh, and also they're really, 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 you know, fucked up corporation rules, which were terrible, which just was, you know, but basically I would just give one small example. We asked them to install PHP and they installed it and they, they gave nobody rights to it because nobody told them that they should give rights to this particular code. And then you had to write, you know, official letter and then it takes five minutes. And all the time, yeah, the code thing. So this kind of thing, you, you don't add, uh, now we expect it and we guard ourselves with the contracts, but that's just that's assumptions basically. Assuming that you know what the provider will uh, uh, you know will provide this, 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 this expertise. And then if they don't, then we say okay, so we stop working on the project because you know something is broken. So this is basically what we will learn, but this this particular yeah. how much details do you go in the assumptions? Uh, it can be just a, uh, let's say, the design of the particular page will not introduce any new elements from the current, you know, what's on this URL. 
this is fairly good because it, it gives you opportunity to really examine what it does. Or you know that uh, you know loading time shouldn't be you know uh, it's okay if they exceed X or something like that. So that's this is one thing, and the other is really contractual stuff where you really guard yourself against. Okay, I'm assuming your operations partner is not a complete you know, useless. <laughs> so yeah, that takes all time. Yeah. For uh, when things went well. Yeah. What was the uh, do you know the what was the relative error that you got? Uh, reality date for the project and, for example, estimated at ninety percent. Okay, we never do a deadline for a project be because we can scope. No, the scoping is, is is key here. But usually we let's say on a on a on a yeah on a, on a project with a deadline of I don't know six months we usually aim to be finished by like five, and that's that's by the time that it should be functionally complete. So that's more or less there, but for a small project, it, 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 it changes. So you end up, you ended up reducing scope. I uh, know. Uh, we we uh, set up the deadlines so we have time to really you know fix stuff if we if we see that it doesn't work. And usually for let's say like a six month bid uh, project, one month is enough. So we kind of edit. It's only it's buffering. Right. right. So underestimating by roughly. No, no, you don't underestimate. You estimate it's like it would take this amount to that amount, and then on that, when you when you do that, add a month because stuff will happen, and we need to be able to, you know, yeah, yeah. correct for that. No, I'm not sure. Because in, in an environment when it's not so important to blow the deadline, mm -hmm. like when it's just for to actually be able to sync up things, right? Yeah. So in that kind of environment, underestimating is yeah. equally bad as over. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In, in that, we always. Um, in, in case, for example, we work with a, with a partner company which does you know, mobile, so you know, we have to do APIs and they, uh, it, it's basically the same thing. We make sure that we understand the scope, then estimate this uh, pessimistic, uh, one thing, we always use pessimistic as, as any estimate that we would internally use. We, we, it kind of even, evens out, but it's more in the between most likely and pessimistic than in most, between most likely and optimistic, and that's usually the case. So we always use pessimistic and then add some time. Not particular working time or resources, but just time. So we know that we in this particular day we will be definitely ready. This this kind of works for us. So so uh, maybe it's overestimating really, but in, in the essence, in, in the end it doesn't it doesn't really appear to be overestimated. If you, you use up these resources. And also uh, if you end up with a couple of you know, few mandates, you know, left, then you can do some effect and do so that, then the scope changes come handy because it you know extend the scope. But it's not scope; it's implementation. Add some you know stuff there. That's needed for that. And I just want to clarify: there's a difference between estimating time and, and then scheduling that estimated time. Yeah. So he's talking about adding time to the schedule, schedule yeah. not to the estimate. So it's two very different mm -hmm. things. But number-wise, it's with most of it been uh, most likely and pessimistic. It goes more towards pessimistic, usually. For scheduling? No, no, for, for the real time that we spend on a particular item. Yeah. Uh, I worked as a project manager for two years, and I mm -hmm. did see this project. It, it's for the first time I see it. Oh. Uh, and I'm interested in whether if, if you work with uh, cost benefit analysis, mm -hmm. what analysis, uh, gun, shine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, uh, it's it's similar. Oh, yeah. It's but just no, it's just a way to really get some 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 numbers. I mean, uh, Roy and stuff like that, and then as well. This is just just there is a mainly risk analysis, and that this gives you real good you know, information. What that's really stating the you know, positive negative risk. This is sim that what I said is simpler version of, of that. So it just gives you the context. It goes into assumptions. Because if we, if or specification and everything, because if there is a risk, then you have to say, okay, this my estimate holds. If this risk happens or doesn't happen, or happens only this part, but it will not. So that's, that's the idea. Yeah. When doing the estimate, for example, you do the estimate. Does yeah. it mean that you will do the, the actual development as well? Ideally, yeah. You um, the, the results are always best if the team are doing the estimate. Yeah, I, I know this. This is tricky. We tried the other way around. Uh, it can work. But it's I we weren't able to really pinpoint when it works when it when it doesn't. 
because ideally you will only be pretty much accurate about it yourself and these discussions are really this is why in scrumming this kind of works because at the same people are you know estimating and, and so why that's why you are much more much likely to hit this, the sprint target than than what six month project target. So in continuation, so how do you handle this? Uh, uh, first of all you don't you don't uh, Give the entire project to the junior. So uh, this is really good. Uh, uh, they give a really good insight because they sometimes ask you, but this seems very complex. So, so how come it's only ten hours? And then you figure out, okay, yeah. And then you start to explain. This is like a rubber duck to button. So you just start explaining, and you see, okay, maybe I was off. And this can, yeah. So 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 this this works. I mean, if, if you have a team of five juniors, it will not work because they have no idea. But and range is still. But, yeah, but also you have to take into account, for example, the junior doesn't work the same speed as a senior developer. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's true. I mean, this is this is part of when we estimate this is for a like, you know, standard developer. And then resource managers kind of translate this into schedules. So, uh, one thing, uh, at our company, the, the, the developer just gives the uh, resource estimates. And then the project managers does all the, do all the, the scheduling and resource and stuff like that. So, so because uh, for the reasons that you said, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, yes, you're on the same uh, uh, link to the same topic. Mm -hmm. For the project, if you don't have the tasks, um, there's no how do you account for parallelization and for, for, for what? Well, multiple team members uh, parallelization of work. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Ideal, as I said, the task should be um, a function of units, so to say. That each of them should deliver value. And then, in idea, in ideally, they should be uh, independent of each other. At most yeah, times. they never are. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, they, they are not really, really. They are, they are, uh, it, uh, if you see, okay, so if you're talking about user stories, then it, it goes, it's hard, it goes to epics. Stuff from the different epics are completely, par usually completely par parallelized. Stuff from one ep from, from from a single epic cars that belong to a single epic, not so much. But you can do it. I mean, you cannot really paralyze any task. But it is doable. Uh, if you, there is, uh, this is now, you know, like business analyst talking, it, there is a, you know, difficulty about this job is really to slice things up in a meaningful functional uh, units which deliver, both deliver value can be, de can be demoed to a fairly non technical person and can be as paralyzable. So this part is not that there is, but user, in our experience, user story is really, really good for them for that. So, yeah. Estimating in hours versus estimating in story points. Yeah, uh, we went full circle on that, really. We started in hours, and then we went, we went to Scrum, and we estimated with story points. Uh, I mean, it works, but it has its really, uh, for, for waterfall projects, it doesn't work because you cannot really translate it into, into you know, Deterministic, we cannot translate this into, into hours. So, and you have for both for projects, you have to have, you know, exact budget. But for, from the Scrum, what we find problematic is that clients just don't want to get this concept. They see a number and they and they try to use it in all sorts of ways, which is not designed, which is not designed for. And you know, it's not comparable between teams and so on. So um, we are kind of going back to having range estimates in hours because in, in essence. Uh, uh, sprint uh, the, the story points just gives you gives you two things. It's able to just measure of, of, of how much your team will burn through the backlog, and pretty much uh, it helps you to answer the question: Will this you know chunk of work fit into the sprint? Most that's that's what they do most. So uh, what we figured out with sprint is we have two weeks sprints, and uh, having range estimates in hours is. Uh, Provided the tasks are small enough to be not more than three days of work for a single developer, this is completely manageable by a by, by fairly you know, standard team, and uh, gives you an exact kind. Of, so it gives you the number which said does will this fit into the sprint? So this is covered. This is pretty okay. Uh, we didn't see any change in rate of failed sprints or sprints that didn't reach the goal. When we switched to this, and even even it even went up, it, it, it was kind of better because it was more relatable to the new guys who came into the team. And there is another metric which you can use 
for uh, measuring overall you know, speed of the, of the team or how much work is left. And that's, uh, okay, so this is now going to behavior driven development. Number of acceptance tests, automatic acceptance tests that, 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 that pass. Because this is really directly linked to the, to the business outcome. And then it, um, you, can, you, you, you can have burnout charge just based on that. And if you add another additional cards and everything, it goes up. You have all you know, standard artifacts of, of the burnout chart, even if you're not using smart phones. So we're kind of doing this now. I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure if this is. We haven't had, had decided if this is the way to go, but it looks promising. Okay, uh, thank you again, yeah. Vertical and I have probably done at least 50 estimates together, whereas I was the PM and he was acting as the, uh, the CTO. Uh, so we have an extensive history there. Uh, one thing that I think wasn't mentioned that maybe people are curious about is that you touched on assumptions and um, I think it's really important to define exactly what you are estimating because when you do have a variance, let's say I say 20, you say 10, I might be considering things like unit tests. Um, so what are some other things that PMs can ask questions and say, okay, what about unit tests? What about B, C, D? What are some other things that we might ask questions about? Yeah. Is it okay, so, uh, it is? Oh, okay, so, um, so it depends on who you have in the team. Ideally, you will have business analysts. So, so, so somebody who will be able to translate from the business domain and give you some you know, educated guesses on situations and it, it will help. Unit testing is one thing, but the, the, it's perfectly fine if there is a conscious decision on we will not have that because X, Y, Z. So yeah, um, I, do, I don't think there is really a factor. You, this all comes to discussions. So you just challenge stuff, ask questions, and, and basically listen to what people are talking about. And that, that's pretty much it. I, I don't recall any you know, standard like checklist aspect with this, this. I for sure had one in my head, which was, are we doing testing? Which the answer should be yes. And then um, if we're estimating on like mobile, is this uh, both iOS and Android, or maybe just one or the other? Yeah. Because that will double your estimate. Yeah, okay. That kind of stuff, I mean, do, are we in responsive design, or I mean, now the answer is always yes, but while well, before, before it wasn't, yeah, back when it wasn't. wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff, so it, it really depends on how well you are understand your the domain is it of, of the project that you're working with. I mean, for that, for to ask the questions that this team asks, uh, you have to know that there is you know, separate development for the iOS and Android, that there is such thing as responsive design and so on. So, I mean, the best thing is just to, but you don't have to understand it very well. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of this. Okay, uh, next question. Should sales be in the estimate meeting? What do you think? Well, well basically, how we do it at my project manager, he, he expects everything, uh, all those information that you just mentioned from, from myself, from the client's meeting, like uh, is the iOS and Android, is it just the iOS, is it uh, more from the website? Yeah, this, this is usually uh, covered off for us by business analysts. So he, you know, right on the basic assumption he runs that that's the kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, my answer is yes, I, I can also do it. Yeah. But my perspective on this is they usually, in my experience, they're, they're, they kind of passive role and they shouldn't. I mean, active role in the sense that you can ask them and get the feedback information that will help you make a better estimate for what they are trying to sell. So that's, if they're just sitting there and wait for a number and then go away with it, this usually doesn't work well. They usually come back and ask for a low, lower number. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from my audience? Advice for when you realize that you got it correct or wrong. 
<laughs> advice for when it goes horribly wrong. So let's say we're halfway through a project. Yeah, and you realize you're like you five months off, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, first there has to be a really, really good reason to be really, really long. So, so you usually have stuff. I mean, the, just be open with it and just get it. It's like, you know, pulling a band-aid. It's, it's, it will hurt, but you should do it sooner than later. And for really big mistakes, there's really a reason, which is, which you can use to debate. Sometimes uh, the reason is such where such obvious one that even client complies with it to, to a degree, but I mean, it's never pleasant. I mean, it, it's pain. Uh, for me, I think you will discover maybe some of the some of the reasons that this might happen, you will discover during estimation. For instance, if you have that very large range, five to 60 hours, then you can look and you can say, look, we, need, we can't estimate this, we have to do a research phase first. And we're gonna spend 20 hours doing research and then we will be able to actually estimate the full problem. Yep. Uh, so that's one strategy you can take. Maybe. Yeah, the, 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 it's, it's identifying risk. And the one thing that, why this um, splitting things up in very small demo chunks allows you to really, really, really see the problem very early on. Because it, it's never everything is perfectly fine, really until it's terribly long, then it's usually you know, a bit iffy from the, from the beginning, where, 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 where these things happen. Yeah. So, uh, and one other thing is your contracts hopefully kind of support you where if there's some, uh, if like a plumber comes to your house and they say, oh yeah, I'm gonna fix your toilet, and then like all your pipe, pipes are rotted out, they're protected because they're talking about visible versus hidden work. So maybe you say, oh yeah, I'm gonna add this to your system, but you have a disclaimer, we're not going to do any refactoring. And then once you start working on the system, you realize, oh, all this stuff has to change because it's not going to work the way we thought of it. You can rely on these clauses to protect you, hopefully. Yeah. So it, in my opinion, it should be like the last ditch resort this, because this never ends well. I mean, uh, so I be open, but uh, keep track of the, of the stuff that you guys doing develop and have. Uh, my, I mean, our, my strategy is usually to get the most risky stuff first, and then I'm pretty sure that we're not really, really, really open with that. In this particular case, when we had this operations provider, it wasn't our choice for it to be so late. It wasn't, we, we couldn't change. So it was everything about it that could go wrong went wrong. So but this is very, very rare case. So. Usually the client understands if you're very upfront and honest with them, but not always. Okay. There's someone had a question over there. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So that point, the corrective ones usually hurt more. Of yeah. Try to try to take preventative actions instead of corrective actions. And uh, the clause in this case, I would say a clause stating before starting work, we mean no, no. That's, that's exactly. Yeah. 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 Not the full problem. No. We have this for this particular kind of scenarios in every contract setting. Okay. How do you write down a number? Like, what's the difference between picking? four and a half hours versus five hours versus six hours. How do you, do you have any methods to choose a specific number? No, really, I, I mean, I've tried to think of it as in a real days multiplied by six. Well, why six? <laughs> because uh, six is, in my experience, typical number of productive hours that you get in a day from developers. It's not it's easy, not interrupting that. I mean, you, if you can get more, but uh, you are estimating for kind of averaging. So if there are some people who can work 10 productive hours in a day for two weeks, and then they you know they, they work four for, for the next week. So it averages out to one six, in my opinion. So Toby you shook your head and you disagree with that number. So. Yeah, I think six hours a day of productive work is very optimistic there. <laughs> I don't know in my own in my experience I'm estimating in day. So the smallest unit I use is half a day and it is uh, Half hours, so they plan down to around five productive hours per developer per day, and then uh, so the, the, even if the change is really small, I will never estimate it at less than uh, half of a day. Because I want to change the background to green. What? I want to change the background to green. Yeah, yeah. half day. Half day. Yeah, because you can you cannot get it uh, deployed in production to production uh, in less than half a day. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's a great point there. So deployment, do you include this in your estimate? Yeah, everything. It should be, I mean, 
uh, it depends pretty much it, it depends on assumption. By default, yes. But if uh, the deployment is done by somebody else, then we just allow this particular Android project as soon as we deliver to to the particular person. That's it. Question. Question again. Sorry. Uh, so what is the problem about the actually uh, I think two separate things. First one, you're talking about estimates which can be in hours, but that mandates all is okay. But you're talking about five productive hours a day or six, it's mostly scheduled, it's not estimates. Yeah. So you missed the point there completely. No, no, this is uh, <laughs> this is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you are right, in this context, yes. yes. What, what he was asking was the mental process. My mental process is say, okay, I figure if I, I try to model the thing that I'm going to do in my mind and see how many days ideal days. I mean, if it's more than, whether I can do it in a week, whether I can do it in a day or two or three, and then, you know, because the numbers they we usually have is in hours, I then I, then I translate it, but it's it's not not scheduling. So this is just about, let's say, effort, average effort that you will take. That's why I think effort is mostly, well, best done in hours. Yeah. So mandates, I think mandates are presented with us. Yeah. Pers personally, that's how I do it. I, I estimate everything in hours, and then I worry about scheduling afterwards yeah, once we have some. This is where you worry about parallel parallelization. Is that even like parallelization? No. Okay. Uh, and, and efficiency, developer efficiency, vacations, sick time, all that ha for me is scheduling. Yeah. Yeah, I just like to leave a comment there. So basically, we estimate in hours. Uh, we should take into consider that uh, there are different tasks. So basically, if you are asking a developer to do, estimate something for you, he can estimate that is like five hours. Okay, you as a PM, you'll see, okay, we have a three hours there more in a day, so we will, uh, we will estimate in a week, like, I don't know, some n amount of hours. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. something. Yeah. So basically, why I'm using a days? Because in my history, I, I was using hours before, and I think that all estimates through the time should be adjusted. So when I say five hours, but you said six hours, I believe it's based on, on the history. So uh, I, sh I think everybody should find what, what, what works for them. I saw that uh, switching from hours to days during the estimates, though I'm not talking about uh, scheduling, I'm not talking about setting the dates. I'm just uh, talking about how much work does it take for me to implement this thing. So uh, estimating in days was the best for me. Yes, of course. So how are you, well, precise? So I have uh, this metric called the fuck up factor. <laughs> and on creation is called the factor Zaeva. So basically for me, it's 30%. On my, every my estimate, I'm adding up 30% without telling the PM. So he will probably add some buffer, but that, I, because in my history, I started with like 15%, then increase it to 50%. And then I. <laughs> Please go away. Uh, I, I just to interject. Uh, when I, I worked for another development company in the states, and we would we would all estimate based off of a staff developer, the, the mid-range developer, not even non senior, so staff developer. And then um, we would add twenty-five percent for unit tests, and then we would add another twenty-five percent for fuck ups, and then we would add another twenty percent for profit. So we just stack this all on top, and that's the number we identify. And if we finish early, we finish early. Yeah. yeah I just like to comment here. To, uh, earlier, we mentioned including unit tests yeah. in estimates. That's really wrong. So if you have to estimate additional time for unit tests, you are doing something wrong. The unit tests are part of development. I agree. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just like this. Yeah. yeah. But, but some developers don't think this way. Some developers think, I'm going to write this function or this method and implement this code, and then I'm going to write tests. And that should not be the case. So when you're talking to your developers, make sure you ask them, are you including tests? That is the vital question. Okay, I just wanted to say that there's a lot of that, uh, that we go back to and tell we're so expensive because you add like a 50, 50, 30% on top of your <laughs> <laughs> Development is expensive. Well, yeah. Quality development. Yeah. That's a key. But I, I have I know. <laughs> oh. uh, so there's, when you estimate, usually you've got like a deal time in your mind. Oh, oh, what? 
Okay. When you're asking, you've got ideal time. Like you've got time where you know nobody bothers you and you're in. Really you're in the zone. Yeah, you're in the zone, which is very rare because you know the distractions and people asking you questions. Hey, where is that function? And to maybe have bugs. Have you tried extra extracting the factor from past data? Um, I, I have not done that, but I'm just going to say one thing real quick. Uh, I, when I was working at Three Coder, one thing I implemented was. There are no meetings for developers except on Friday, period. You cannot go to a meeting unless it's Friday. Because you need to be able to come to work and not spend an hour and a half thinking, oh gosh, is that meeting right now? Oh no, no, wait, I still have an hour. Is that meeting right now? Oh no, no, it's a half an hour. And then afterwards, yeah, yeah, but then it's you're not 100% focused. So. Uh, okay, and if you have more than eight hours of if you have more than eight hours of meetings, then like, why does it not to be in more than eight hours of meetings? Change the content. We cover this. It's, it, this is what the range is for. Because there can be no single number. If you, you estimate what is you, the pessimistic one is, I will bet my monthly salary that I, will, I can do it before. You know, everything, I, there are no constraints, I can do it in this amount of time or less. So this is, this is, this is why, uh, if you're not sure, you will go high. Very high, and that indicates that there is, you know, unsaid assumptions and so on. So this is why we have the range. So uh, it's what uh, Steve asked, and you know, how much, how I come with the number like 12 or something. This is for most likely, and then you go uh, optimistic, and then you go pessimistic, and then you kind of cover it all. But that's very important. Yeah, you, you can have really high pessimistics, like really high, and they'll drag up your whole average. So if one out of the ten things goes terribly wrong, you'll be covered because your average is high. Yeah, I wasn't where I was interested in if somebody actually if you took the factor out. Because I'm wondering what's the, I'm trying, what's the usual ratio between expected focus and actual focus? Because I, in, in my measurements, I've seen factors to roughly be from 0 0.4 to 0 0.7. And 0 0.4 is really worrying, which means that, you know. Do you mean 40% of the time? So the actual, uh, your how much in the time that you expected to get like an hour, you actually did forty percent of the hours because the distractions of the workplace was so high. But uh, it will uh, depend on the environment because uh, some development teams also do ops, some don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see if somebody else tried to get that. Yeah, it's not, you can account for that in the estimations, but the more worrying part for me is the yeah. fact that somebody is being distracted. This yeah. is that case, sorry, the, the case that I said when we, when we were also very wrong with the situation where we kind of, okay, two, day, two weeks, two days this week and one day next week and, and it adds up, but the utilization is terrible. It's, yeah, around 40%, maybe less. So. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think you can actually get more as long as, um, as long as the developer can like shut off email for a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you don't have to go to any meetings, that's immensely helpful. And for me, it's six hours max. So I would suggest project rooms, or just the project rooms. What was it, sorry? Project rooms. Yeah. Project rooms, yeah, yeah. that's correct. So yeah, yeah he, it's a full remote team, so. We're fully remote, so everybody has its own room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you, you're like expected to be in Slack, right? Yeah. No, I go offline. Okay, sometimes. yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that, that should totally be allowable. Yeah. How many stories do you have in the same time? Uh, per developer or per project manager? Per project manager. Per project manager, I mean, I manage, I don't know, like 25 projects at a time, but they were small. Okay, yeah, we have like three ops, let's call it. Can you define small? Can you define small? Like five to 10 hours a month. Small. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're ongoing projects, they're ongoing. So. How many teams? How many teams? Yes. That was one team. Yeah, but they're small projects, so like one person will work on one thing for one day and then be on something. I mean, it's easy for you to look at one thing. So. Yeah. I didn't say it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I was, I was, sorry, one, one second. I was trying to feed you earlier about Fibonacci. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was a good thing. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good thing because. Uh, so, what, what is Fibonacci, first? Okay, so this is from story points, and, but it doesn't really work now. So. Uh, it prevents uh, false accuracy because it's just uh, this is the sequence of numbers when you, when you add 
two to the further than the two and the fourth degree. It rises and it's not really complicated. So it's like two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. So what it, what it just forces you is it, your estimate can be only one of those numbers. So it's uh, it really provides uh, a way of not you know put a estimating really false accurately. For example, if I estimate that something is 34 hours or 35 hours, I have no idea. This, I just made it up. There is no way you can you can you can know this this uh, this little distinction. But the point is that Fibonacci there is no 34. Probably there is no no there is there is 24. So so you you are forced to really choose, and this this works well. It works. I mean, this is the idea for for planning block and it works really well for story points. For hours, it can also work, but there are kind of different things, so it's not really completely translated. Yeah. Okay, there was a question back in there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's say you made an estimation and had process and everything have an estimate, yeah. and you come to Christian, for example, yeah. and you tell him, so this is the amount of hours, yeah. and he says, yeah, okay, we can start, so this is the time, but we won't go, you know, just too much. How how do you then handle this situation? You know? I mean. Ideally, he will tell me, okay, if it's less, than, if, I can sell it if it's less than this amount. And then when will, when does he say that? Uh, ideally, he should he should he should come and say, okay, this is the budget that I want to really work with, and then you design, you know, your assumptions and solution which fits into this. So so this this is completely different. Uh, if this not is not the case, usually it isn't. Then you come with the number as you said, and then he asks for a lower price. Then we ask that case okay, so what's what's with this lower price. And if he says something ridiculous, then we say it just can't be done. And it's better to find out that way than just do five estimates and everybody's going to piss off because we're just we're doing the job in their mind by worsening the product. So, so then it's, yeah, that, that's bad. How, how we work, we, we typically say before you're starting to estimate, so we tell them the budget. So uh, that, that's how we eliminate it. And yeah. then if the estimate is like way over, then we propose like three different options for the budget to the client. And that's Typically, I, I get like I don't know this project like a hundred hours. Then, then of course we add up like a half of the margin or something like that. Really, 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 really. Yeah. Yeah. Developers should never talk money. That's so. also sales is probably in the meeting as well. And then to to hit the point you made about um, flexibility in the in the scope. Uh, so just to re-clarify that, if the client says, oh, I need people to be able to upload photos, you can implement that functionality in like 10 different ways. You can have like a bot that goes and reads their Facebook and like grabs all their photos for them. Or you could just have a dummy submit field that takes the photo and it doesn't try to rotate it or resize it or anything, it just uploads it. So there's, those are two very different features, but they accomplish the same thing. So by talking about what you're accomplishing as part of your specifications, then you allow yourself flexibility, especially in price, but also as soon as you're behind schedule, you can say, hey, we were planning on doing this really cool thing, we're just gonna like simplify it a little bit so we won't have. Yeah, well, this doesn't really fly because there are, there are, there are There's screens in design. Yeah. And there are, there are uh, exceptions to do so they're, they're defined upfront. But they can be defined in such a way that they are not, that you can fulfill them with a bit of smaller, I mean, you will get 20% out of it. Not something that you will that you will save your project, but it adds up. So so this this is this is key. But it's completely doable, and the key is to really write it in this particular format. So it's not really every single thing is defined completely. Final question from you. Someone. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Last question. How do you handle unplanned work? Every project has unplanned work. It's it's buffer. We I think we have like. Do you uh, what do you track on the plan? Yeah, yeah, we track. We, we log every, you know, all, all the work. We, we, I mean, we, we use U-Track and then pretty much log to the task, to, to, to the cards. And we see one, you know, there are tags that you add in your logs. And, and then, uh, sorry, uh, to get better also, do a retrospective and see what, what went wrong and what was correct, what was accurate, what was not accurate. If you build, um, I don't know, a, a chat system, yeah. The next time you build the chat system, you should know if last time you were accurate with your estimate. 
and PMs usually, uh, I mean, not usually actually, they, they, they look at the statistics. They said, I'm not a PM for quite, quite some time, so I don't really look at that. And they actually add those things up based on histor history because here is, that's easy because we have history data. And I didn't bring it because I just, yeah, I didn't think about it. And I'm no, no longer a PM. Right. What was your follow up? Uh, my follow up question was about unplanned work. Uh, when you track it and it uh, affects your sprints, sprint goals, how do you handle that? Do you have a lot of unmet goals at the end of sprint? Or? No. Uh, here I have data. I mean, we failed for, for one you know, better uh, agile project. We failed with usually one goal per, per every 10 sprints. So it's, it's uh, uh, every two, two or three months. Yeah, so it's like, uh, yeah, like six months. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's about it. So this is perfectly fine. It's usually because somebody got sick so, or there's some fairly obvious reason and it's never a problem because